Our scripture reading today is from the fifth chapter of Mark, verses 1 through 20, and I invite you to listen to the word. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when they had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he broke into pieces, and no one had enough strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains he was always howling, and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and this herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The swine herds ran off and told it in the city and the, in the country. The people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and they saw this demon act sitting there clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion. And they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by the demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are certain quotes that will pop into my head on occasions. Some of these quotes, actually most of them, are song lyrics, and some of them are also, of course, quotes from movies, but I also have a few that will reoccur from literature. And one quote from, is from Shakespeare, and it became the sermon title, What's in a Name? Now, sidebar about this particular quote, I have a mental block on its location. Every time that I think of it, I think it's from one of his sonnets. So out comes my large book of Shakespeare, and I start scanning through the sonnets to find it, right? And every time I get about halfway through the sonnets when my, frame, my brain finally kicks in, duh, it's from Romeo and Juliet. What's in a name? A rose by any other name would smell just as sweet. Now, I think the mental block is there because Romeo and Juliet is my least favorite Shakespeare play. 
This line, what's in a name, is from one of Romeo's speeches, and at its heart is the fact that these two are separated from each other because of their names. Their families are in conflict with each other. They're warring with each other. What's in a name? And should a name have that much power or control over life? Names meant something, and they still do, actually. Many of our surnames mean something. In some cases, they reflected on a person's work. Baker, Carpenter, Mason, Tanner, and so on. In other cases, they provided the location that the person or family was from. Woods, hill, rivers, Churchill. And sometimes they provided identity within the family. Johnson was John's son. Peterson, the same, Thompson, and so on. And first names could have this as well. At one time it was fashionable to name your children after virtues that you hoped they would embody. Faith, grace, hope, prudence, honor, reason. Names meant something in scripture as well. And it was not uncommon for a person to receive a new name to indicate a significant moment or change. Abram and Sarai become Abraham and Sarah. Jacob is named Israel. Simon becomes Peter. Saul becomes Paul. Why? Because names mattered. In today's passage, we encounter two names that have significance, and strangely enough, neither name is uttered by Jesus, by the disciples, by any of the witnesses, but by the demons who possessed the man. Following the teaching of several parables, Jesus decides to leave the crowds behind and crosses the Sea of Galilee. Now this is the sea crossing where the winds pick up and everyone on board panics except for Jesus who's asleep in the stern. They wake him up, he rebukes the storm, and then there is a dead calm. And it ends with the verse. And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea Obey him. Who is this? Who is this person that we've been following, that we've seen heal? We've seen him cast out demons. We've heard him teach. But, but this, having control over the elements, who is this guy? The answer comes from a very unlikely source. When they arrive on shore, they are in the country of the Gerasenes. This is Gentile country. And no good first century Palestinian Jew would willingly go there. So when one night, Jesus brings down two more barriers. One, a natural boundary, the sea and the storms. And a human-made one, the boundary between people. Still shaken up from the boat ride and anxious about being where they don't belong, the disciples are greeted by another fright, right? The demon act. A man possessed by demons who has been cast out of his community because they could not control him, who resides among the dead and spends his time howling through the tomb. When this man sees Jesus coming, he runs towards him, bows down, and howls, What have you to do with me? Of course, it's not the man who is howling, but the demons inside him. And then they name him Jesus, Son of the Most High God. disciples were questioning who he was, not doubting, 
but wondering. Who is this man? And the demons provide the answer. He is the son of the Most High God. They are the ones who recognize who Jesus is and they beg him not to torment them. They beg him not to cast them out. It's ironic. The demons beg Jesus not to do to them what they have done to the man, tormented him and caused him to be cast out. Jesus demands to know the Spirit's name, and they answer, My name is Legion, for we are many. Now this escalates the drama of the story even more, because Legion was a Roman word, a Roman military word, used to describe two troops that numbered about 6,000 soldiers. It is a not-so-subtle poke on Mark's part at the Romans who occupied the land at the time, who subdue, torment, and even cast out those who are different. My name is Legion, for we are many. And so the scene is set for this for a continued confrontation between the Son of the Most High God and Legion. But there's no battle. There's no fight here. The demons don't even try to pretend they're powerful enough to resist. Instead, they continue to beg. Don't cast us out. Don't cast us out. Well, please, if you're going to do that, send us into those pigs over there instead. And remarkably, amazingly, Jesus agrees. It's almost as if Jesus has compassion not only for the man, but for the demons that possessed him. Well, until the pigs go mad, and like lemmings rush into the sea, 2,000 pigs suddenly plunge into the water and drown, and the demons are lost to the depths. Now, Oh, now everyone will know who this man really is, right? He's been named and his power again revealed. It's time to be amazed again and for the crowds to start coming to him. Now the crowd does come, but they don't come to be healed and they don't come to learn. In this case, they come and beg, there's that word again, they beg him to go away. Like the demons, they beg Jesus not to torment them. And the only one among them who wants to be near Jesus is the man he healed. Why do the people respond the way they do? Why would they beg the son of the most high God, the one who can heal them, the one who can set them free to leave? Because they have heard the name. And they know what he can do. For wherever the kingdom of God breaks in, it topples the boundaries, the barriers, and the securities that the world creates. And that is not always welcome. For the Gerasenes, it meant destruction to their economy. Their main source of income is now sinking into the sea. What's the guy going to do next? Send demons into their crops where they'll shrivel up and die? In their economic fear and anxiety, they could not welcome the one who could set them on a path of wholeness and restoration. He altered the status quo. And he altered it in another way as well that was not welcome. When the people encountered the once-possessed man clothed and in his right mind, they can't handle it. They were used to him running naked through the graveyard and howling at the moon. They knew who he was. 
that way. And even his unpredictability was predictable to them. As destructive as it was, it was part of their status quo. Oh, they thought they had done what was best for the community in casting him out to live among the dead. Now they're confronted with not only with someone they don't know, they don't know him in his right mind, but they are also confronted with how they treated him because they will have to find a new way to treat him. And the shame that causes will arise every time they see the man. The other irony here is that Jesus could have cast that shame from them if they could have named it. But they cannot name it, or they will not name it. And so their response to it is, Sir, would you please leave without making a scene? What's in a name? In Mark's gospel, it is the demons who first recognize Jesus and name him for who he really is, the Holy One of God, the Son of the Most High God. They are the ones who know him, and in naming him, they acknowledge the power he has to set those possessed and oppressed free. I wonder sometimes if we really understand what we are saying when we use these names. Do we really understand what we are saying when we call Jesus names like Christ, Messiah, Savior, Son of the Most High God, and so on? Or have these names just become identifiers with little or no meaning or power? If we were really to understand what we are saying, would we also fall to the ground begging him not to torment us? Would we be like the crowd and beg him to go away and leave us alone? When Christ appears, his very presence can threaten what keeps us shackled. Christ disrupts our illogical reason, our madness, that says as long as we can maintain equilibrium, keep up the status quo, even a destructive status quo, we're doing fine. His presence can shed light on the hidden shames that keep us from receiving the healing he brings to the world. And our shames are legion. They are many. We have personal shames. Hurts we have caused to others. Hurt that has been caused to us. Shames over the way we look the way we live, the way we act, what we like, what we don't like. We have corporate shames. The way that systems and institutions have cast out to live among the dead those who did not quite fit into the status quo, those who threatened the equilibrium. All of these all of these can keep us as restrained by destructive habits and patterns and attitudes as the shackles that they tried to use on that possessed man. But Christ, the Son of the Most High God, will ask us their names. Because when we name our shame, we can be released from it. 
Jesus comes, breaking into the world to set us free from the legions of shame. But two things have to happen. One, we have to be willing to truly acknowledge who Jesus is in the names we give him because names mean something. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Son of the Most High God is not just a fancy job title. To call him thus means that we fall flat on our faces in awe of what he has done and can do. Second, when he asks our name, we answer. Not with the name we're given at birth or the nickname we acquired in the second grade, but with the name of those things that keep us from the wholeness he offers. We name our shame. Names mean something. The question behind it all is, by what name will you call Jesus? To the townspeople of Jerusalem, Jesus was an unwelcome intruder who threatens their economic security and challenges the status quo. To the demons, he was the son of the most God, high God, the one with the power to send them packing. To the man he healed, he was the Lord. He was the Christ who released him from his torment. As to the disciples, well, they don't have an answer to their question yet. Who then is this man? Do we? Can we risk naming him in order that he may reveal the names of the legion that keeps us bound? Can we call him son of the most high God? The very one who brings salvation and shalom to broken lives. What's in the name? Everything. Amen. Amen.